Welcome back. I'm Tom Shod, your host, and I'm here with our guest this episode, Edward M. Lerner, author of Interstellar Net Enigma from Fox Acre Press, which is in bookstores now. Ed, welcome back to the show. Hi, Tom. Good to be here. Uh, now, this Interstellar Net Enigma is the third in, a, in the Interstellar series that you've written. Right. Uh, and actually, there's been a rather long gap between the first two novels, which were uh, Origins and New Order. Right. And then it was almost, what, almost five years before the novel Enigma was uh, put to press. What happened in all that time? You spent so much time creating this incredibly complex and interesting world. Well, part of it is uninteresting, life intruding. Part of it is it was a complicated sort of problem. So let me go give some background on the book. Okay, that'd be great. And, and that explains it. Part of how this book came about is just that I'm an ornery sort. A lot of contemporary science fiction makes two very convenient assumptions, that faster than light travel is possible and that we have lots of intelligent neighbors. Now, apart from authorial convenience, there's no good justification for those things. Uh, Star Trek does this sort of thing all the time. And not only do we have intelligent neighbors, but their technology is so much like ours that when we bump into each other, we can have meaningful conflict because we have almost the same technology. Well, it's great for storytelling, but how implausible is that? Now, in the Interstellar Net series, I insisted on no faster than light anything. Uh, the whole Interstellar Net neighborhood, which is what you would expect, a bunch of neighboring stars with intelligent species communicating, uh, have to be close together. They only talk by radio at first. When they do develop interstellar travel, it's slower than light. Now, that worked for my stories, and uh, I enjoyed living with the constraints, but I was still living with that other pesky authorial convenience of all these neighbors at all the same levels, the same level, even if the stars uh, that warm their skies were billions of years different in age. I was wondering and wrestling for a, for a while, could I come up with a reason why neighboring intelligent species could uh, exist, have very similar technology levels, even though the galaxy seems to be very quiet and no one's talking to us. I did come up with an answer. That's the central enigma of interstellar net enigma. It took a while to come up with. And you, you actually gave it a name within the, within the uh, body of the novel uh, as a paradox, the initial paradox that we're presented with at the beginning of the story. Yes, the main character in the story is an historian named Joshua Matthews. And he, his co-workers call it the Matthews Conundrum. And, and actually, this is our lead character, and he basically introduces us to the series of events and circumstances that drive the entire story to its conclusion. And I'm going to try to conduct this interview <laughs> with as little delving into the back end of the book as possible. Because no spoilers. I think people, well, minor, a, a little, we'll try to establish a frisson, but we won't try to actually tell them the end of the story like so many movie trailers do nowadays. Because the journey is, all, is, is, is a great part of the pleasure of reading this novel. Uh, but he has been given a rather prestigious task as a historian right. to basically write the history of the uh, Earth interstellar net operation and then all of a sudden finds himself stepping out of a cab that he thought was a short ride and finding that he's been gone for a month in time as far as everybody else in the world is concerned. Right. Right. So... Joshua comes, Joshua Matthews comes from a family that has been instrumental in the development of interstellar net from the human end back to his great, 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 great grandparents. Uh, he gets this appointment to be historian for the interstellar net commerce union and he 
has the plum assignment of writing their definitive history. So when his friends throw this party for him and he gets in the cab and steps out a month later uh, sicker than he was when he stepped in, no one believes that he doesn't know where he's been for a month. There's been no trace of him anywhere. And he's uh, embarrassed, ashamed, discredited, disgraced, unemployable, and he has no idea what's happened to him or why. So yeah, that drives everything in the story and it takes years and light years before he gets his answers. And we meet another uh, a, a series of interesting characters, including at least one alien race where we have a serious, which has a major part to play in the story that evolves out of this initial unfortunate and mysterious incident. Uh, but I wanted to talk about how this particular novel moved forward in time to become the book that we're talking about now, the full book, because it came out, at least in part, in a series of shorter stories or shorter story elements that were published in Analog. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, one of them, the uh, Championship Batak, uh, that segment is currently... Uh, in 2015, a, a Hugo nominee right. for for best novella, I believe is the novelette. Character. Novelette, best novelette. Uh, how did you take? The, why did you take the approach of almost being Dickensian in terms of publishing sections of this book, you know, and teasing people as you walked along a timeline telling this story? Well, for clarification, only about the opening third of the story was in analog. The rest of it uh, only appears in the book form. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's a part of my process. I don't claim to understand it, but uh, I recognize that's how things work. I need to write the first 50, 60 pages and then set something aside for a while. And usually when I come back to it, I realize something needs to change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It needs more depth, less background, different characters, different point of view. It's something different every time, but something has to change. So I had written the first uh, 50 pages or so, had set it aside, and when I picked it up, I said, I know one of the changes I can make. I can make this into a standalone story, and I did. And uh, Analog was interested. Of course, I was delighted with that. I have stuff in Analog quite often. Uh, the second segment that became Championship Batak was a complete shift in character point of view. It switched from human point of view to alien point of view. And uh, that made it a fresh start, a parallel thread. And so when I set that aside and looked at it again, I said, huh, that's another story. Uh, I considered continuing this way, but as I got further and further into the story to make the pieces standalone so they could run in the magazine would have entailed an awful lot of repetitive backstory, which mm -hmm. might have been annoying for people who had read the earlier segments. But having said all of that, uh, the story is episodic and it does have exciting cliffhangers uh, every uh, 80 pages or so. Right. And so the publisher and I agreed, hey, let's make this a serial in ebook form. And so pick your favorite ebook book vendor, Kindle or Nook or Kobo or whatever. And the book's available in serial form. Now, was this the first time that you'd actually taken a look at, at ebook as a, as a uh, methodology for basically introducing the co story concepts that you were developing that would turn into the full blown novel? Uh, is that something, is this a first for you to do it this way? Well, this is the first time we did an ebook serial. All of my books have been released uh, in ebook sooner or later. Mm -hmm. I mean, my first book that came out in 1991 was before ebooks existed, so it was a while before that got re released, but everything is on ebook. The serial is the new wrinkle. Now, I know we're talking about the standalone novels that you've done yourself, but I wanted to ask a question. Uh, sure. Uh, you did a great deal of work, collaborative work, on a series of novels uh, 
the uh, Fleet of Worlds novels that you did uh, working with Larry Niven. Right. You've talked about your work process, writing something, setting it down, and then coming back to it to re-examine it with a fresh set of eyes. How, was that the same approach you took working with uh, Mr. Niven on these other novels? Uh, was the fact that it kept going back and forth uh, essentially a, a kind of the same process for you? No, the collaborations with Larry were different. The main thing uh, Larry brought to the party was some extremely creative and interesting alien species and a future history of events that spanned hundreds of years. And I wanted to write in his universe mm -hmm. and he very graciously agreed to that. But the plots and a bunch of new characters and mm -hmm. in fact some new aliens are mine. Larry calls collaborating with me a spectator sport, uh -huh. which is very flattering, very kind, and the wealth of uh, creativity that he brought with uh, the aliens and the worlds before and some of the plot lines that I extended uh, were very valuable and very useful. But uh, in terms of the basic storyline, no, those were mine. Now, as I would finish a segment of any of those five stories, I'd send it off to him and he would uh, edit it mm -hmm. because we wanted to have it have some of his, you know, his style in there. And when I write as myself, my style is significantly different than Larry's style. But the goal here was to write it more in his style, and sometimes that took a little bit of rewriting. Now, talking about rewriting, you, you talked about how the, uh, your, your uh, Hugo-nominated story was only a very small portion of the section in the book. How, and you've written so many short stories. I mean, you, you, you're prolific in that way. When you take a look at the list of them and where they've been published and everything else like that, what is the difference in approach in storytelling, if there is one, yeah. between telling a short story, having a, a small frame, a small jewel-like frame that you use to tell a story from beginning to conclusion, and telling a longer tale interconnected in this instance, what do you have to do to modify your writing approach in order to tell that story differently? The process is certainly different. In the case of a short story, I can wrap my head around the whole thing from beginning to end. And as long as I know the beginning and the end, I can write th through <laughs> and, and put a short story together. For anything much longer than a short story, and certainly any novella, any novel, mm -hmm. There are too many moving parts, at least for the stories I choose to tell. And so for novels, I never even try to write the first words of the prologue until I have several pages of outlines. If the story is set any place other than Earth in the present day, then I have pages of notes about, well, how is the setting different? If it's a different world, what's the world like? If it's in the future, how has the future changed from the present day? Notes about uh, the backstory of the characters and what they look like and how they relate to one another. Right. So I need all of that before I can start. Uh, for a short story, that's really not necessary. Now I should warn readers if they, when they get the book, okay. they should be very careful not to do what I have been known to do, which is don't go to the back immediately because you could just absolutely ruin the experience because you are very, very graciously have some notes on uh, the uh, timeline that we're working with. Because this is an alt essentially an alternate Earth history timeline based upon the start of the interstellar net story in and of itself. And uh, you have uh, a, a great deal of backstory and uh, kind of a condensed explanation of some of the behind the scenes dynamics that are, have been going on during the time that the story occurs. And so they should st start from the front, work your way through, let's be very linear about this, and we'll all have a grand time. There are two things at the back, Tom. There is a timeline, as you say, and the timeline is basically a history of interstellar net leading up to this story. 
So for readers who uh, aren't familiar with earlier interstellar netbooks, it is okay if they read the timeline. But there is also a section that talks about the science and uh, some background elements. I don't want to name any less vaguely than we that. Say no more. That we, our mouths are sealed about that. Yeah. <laughs> and that uh, science-oriented appendix is something that absolutely, positively should not be read before the novel. Now, you've been known, and, and Larry Niven has been known, as a, as a hard science writer. And, by the, and I mean that in the best possible way, in basically being consistent with the, your use of scientific principles, scientific theorems, uh, and being consistent in its presentations. There's no magic wand that occurs. Uh, everything is, has a structure and, a, and, and is a reasonable, responsible element. Uh, the idea of any sufficiently advanced technology appears to be magic is not relative, is not regularly present in your work. There is a rational, reasonable, understandable progression of scientific theory and application that you put to your, your storytelling. Uh, how much, I mean, you're, you, you have the training, you have the technological training. Do you have to do an awful lot of additional research to make sure that you're applying sufficient rigor when you use this as part of your storytelling mechanism? Sometimes a story requires a lot of research, uh, certainly some more than others. In a, a book that's set almost 200 years into the future, uh, expecting to connect all of the dots is probably asking too much for the poor reader. Uh, Authors sometimes say that uh, I suffered to produce the background of the story, now it's your turn. <laughs> and I try not to operate on that principle. Uh, so uh, I agree with you that uh, in a lot of my writing I try to keep the science consistent with what we know, but in order for it to also be futuristic, what that means is anything that is not forbidden is permissible. So. I'm not going to say what the advanced technology is in this book. It's permissible within what we understand about the nature of space and time, but it's certainly beyond anything we uh, 21st century humans know how to do. Which is all the more reason to buy the book and read it. Edward M. Lerner, uh, we're out of time. I'm so sorry oh, about that's this. that's too bad. Uh, but Interstellar Net Enigma is in bookstores now, and I encourage everyone here to read it. It was fun. It was interesting, and it was, for me, old codger that I am, a return to the glory days of science fiction and analog when you could get stories like this all the time. So, Ed, thank you so much for being here. We really do appreciate it. And I will not breaking any vows by saying that at the back end of this thing, there is at least a hint that you see the possibility of more stories in this universe in the future. I do. I like uh, the interstellar net community, and it just gets bigger and broader and more promising with each story. Ed, thank you so much for being our guest. Thanks. Well, this is it for this edition of Fast Forward. We hope you found something of interest. We hope you come see us again. Until then, this is Tom Shad saying, take care.